flying machine ever created. A miracle of engineering that can take us virtually anywhere and bring us back alive. But sometimes the air strikes back hard and fast and deadly. Now there's a new breed of helicopter built for the 21st century. Some call them supercopters, and this is one of the best. The Augusta Westland EH-101. How does this mechanical marvel defy gravity and rule the sky? Somewhere off the coast of Italy, a man is drowning. One of the most advanced helicopters ever built is racing to his rescue. The Augusta Westland EH-101. It's designed for an emergency like this. Its rotor blades are revolutionary. They're driven by three of the most sophisticated engines ever made. And it's huge, almost 75 feet from nose to tail and tipping the scales at 15 tons. A giant that can range 900 miles out into the open sea at a top speed of almost 200 miles an hour. And when it finds its man, it can fight winds of over 50 miles an hour to hover rock steady in the sky, saving seconds in a race where death holds the stopwatch. To the Italian Navy's Flying Shark Squadron, it's a deadly serious training mission. But to the EH-101, this is child's play. It's one of the new generation supercopters that are taking our 21st century skies by storm. The Sikorsky S-92 NH Industries NH90 and the Augusta Westland EH101. This American version of the EH101, known as the US101, was chosen by the US Navy as the next presidential helicopter. Designated Marine One, creating the Oval Office in the sky will be a joint venture of three firms. Augusta Westland, Bell Helicopters, and Lockheed Martin. It will truly be a supercopter. But no matter how advanced, the flight of any helicopter is governed by three major components. Call it the rule of three. The main rotor. The engines. And the tail rotor. Three components that have to work together for a helicopter to fly. And this is what the rule of three can achieve. The EH-101 moves through the air like a hummingbird. A 15-ton hummingbird. 
It's precisely because helicopters like the EH-101 can do what no other aircraft can do, can go where no other aircraft can go, can reach places we can reach by no other means, that we've come to depend on them. But when even one component in the rule of three fails, flying machines can become killing machines. In normal conditions, Flying a helicopter is only slightly more dangerous than flying a regular fixed-wing aircraft of the same size. But we did not create the helicopter for the easy jobs of flight. It was made to operate in the outer envelope of risk. And sometimes we push the helicopter too far. The simple but mysterious truth is that the helicopter is a flying machine that doesn't want to fly. That it flies at all is close to a mechanical miracle. A helicopter sitting on the ground is actually more capable of beating itself to death by rolling over and the blades thrashing around in the air than it is of actually flying. The first component in the helicopter's rule of three is its main rotor. Fixed-wing aircraft fly because of the way air naturally flows over their wings as the plane moves forward. They are literally pulled through the air. A helicopter's rotors act like spinning wings. As air moves through them, the rotors lift it up tugging the bird into the sky. And the main rotor doesn't just lift the helicopter, it also propels it forward by driving air backward. Every second the EH-101 is in flight, its massive main rotor is shoving up to 45 tons of air out of its way. 15 tons of aircraft, suspended from five spinning wings. The EH-101's main rotor is an engineering miracle that took decades to perfect. But the story of the rotor is about more than engineering. It's an invention that has changed history. The rotor would come of age in a time of war. And our skies would never be the same. Creating helicopters as advanced as today's supercopters is like creating a robot that can dance. It took us almost as long to solve the mysteries of vertical flight as it did to reach the moon. In 15th century Renaissance Italy, Leonardo da Vinci imagined a flying machine that would twist its way up into the heavens like a screw turning through wood. But the scientific trail to today's supercopters wouldn't involve a screw, but a whirling rotor blade. It's the first and most important component of the rule of three that governs all helicopter flight. Early rotor blades were made of wood, spinning airfoils that achieved lift, but not much more. But over decades of development, rotors became more versatile and more robust, 
finally propelling the helicopter from the sidelines of flight to the center stage of conflict. A conflict that would last 20 years and involve 3 million American soldiers. The Vietnam War. But it wasn't until the Vietnam War that the helicopter came of age. That's when there were hundreds, if not thousands, of helicopters deployed in one battle zone. Dominating the skies of the Vietnam War was Bell Helicopters UH-1 Huey. It was the world's first supercopter, the first US military helicopter powered by a jet turbine engine, with perhaps the strongest rotor blades in existence. The first time I ever sat in a Huey helicopter and pulled the stick, it was like it fell up. It just had this sudden power up. It was an amazing thing. Although all metal rotors had been fitted to earlier helicopters, the Huey's thick 44-foot-long blade set a new standard for toughness. They could take small arms fire from any conceivable direction and usually survive quite well. Bob Mason is a legendary Vietnam War pilot whose book Chicken Hawk tells his and the Huey's incredible story of war and survival. I remember one time I had to be the last ship out. So I had to take everybody with me. And everybody got on board, and there was one more guy than I thought we could carry. And I couldn't leave the one guy. His Huey dangerously overloaded. Bob Mason had only one way out. But it meant flying straight toward a jungle thicket. So I headed for that thicket, hoping to accelerate enough to get over it. But I didn't, and I had to go through it. So here's a machine that can go through the thicket, chopping off the tops of these small branches with the rotor system, with six or seven screaming American soldiers in the back. <laughs> I mean, I love this machine. <laughs> if the Huey was the supercopter of the 20th century, the EH-101 is chasing that title into the 21st. And just like the Vietnam-era Huey, this supercopter's main rotor blade is a primary reason for its success. But while the Huey's rotors were all metal, the core of the EH-101's blades is paper. Using state-of-the-art technology and composite materials like carbon and glass fiber, these rotors are much lighter and more durable than all metal blades. A core of honeycomb paper is combined with pieces of foam, carved to precise dimensions. They're wrapped with layer after layer of composite fiber material then baked in a pressurized chamber to become as hard as steel. Finished with titanium edges, they're as battle ready as a blade can be. When a bullet hits an all metal rotor, it sends fractures through the entire width of the blade. But when a composite blade takes a hit, the interwoven fibers around the bullet hole are undamaged. And this is what really sets this rotor blade apart, a wing tip. This feature has virtually solved two of the main problems helicopters suffer. Rotor noise, which can warn an enemy of a helicopter's approach. And brownout, dust storms that can blind a pilot during desert takeoffs and landings. Jobs don't come much tougher for a helicopter than pulling hostages out of hostile territory, especially when that territory is a desert. And no hostage rescue mission is more infamous than the ill-fated Desert One in 1980 to rescue U.S. citizens being held in Iran. 
It became helicopter hell in the desert, ending in the deaths of eight American servicemen. But if that mission had to be carried out today with one of the new breed of supercopters, it might have ended differently. One of a helicopter's greatest handicaps during a rescue operation like Desert One is the noise made by its rotors. The enemy can hear it coming. Most rotor noise is caused by the tips of the helicopter's blades moving through the air at supersonic speed. The telltale beating sound is actually a series of mini sonic booms created by the rotor tips. That's where these wing-tipped rotor blades have a killer advantage. Their wing shape allows the rotor tips to spin more slowly and yet still achieve the same lift and thrust. Because the rotor tips don't create the sonic boom effect, the pilots who flown the EH-101 in battle say it's one of the quietest helicopters flying. One of the biggest problems we face is detection. The ability of this aircraft is to arrive relatively silently on the target until literally seconds before we're there. Mike Stangroom is a pilot with the British Royal Air Force's 28th Squadron. He captains their newest asset, the EH-101 we can go alone and unafraid into hostile territory in confidence. The men of the 28th Squadron train relentlessly for rescue missions behind enemy lines. Timing, positioning, and speed must come together. Most of all, it's stealth the key to the success or failure of the mission. The end game is what our job is all about. And there may be enemy on the scene, it might be a hot target. If the enemy hears them coming, the landing might not just be hot, but fatal. EH-101's wing-tipped rotors allow it to carry a rescue force through hostile skies virtually undetected. Giving them the advantage of surprise in a game of life and death. The rescue force finds its target. Hello, Rapier 1, this is Havoc 01, radio check over. And calls the lead EH 101 in for the extraction. Havoc 01, okay. Uh, packaging casualty. Guys, one minute. But if this rescue was for real, and if it was happening in a desert environment, like that faced by the Desert One mission in Iran, the helicopter and the men it's carrying would be facing a danger as great as enemy fire. Sandstorms created by the rotor blades, called brownouts, which can blind pilots on takeoff and landing, are a major cause of helicopter crashes. The EH-101's wing-tipped rotors deal with the desert sands in a way even their developers didn't expect. 
Unlike other rotor blades, the wingtips focus the main force of their downwash at the outside edge of what's called the rotor disc, carving a window of clear air through the brownout, which allows the pilot to see the ground on the way down. It's called the donut effect. The pilot flies in that hole. He has excellent visibility for 90% of the approach. And in the critical stages, he can see his landing point very easily. And what works for sand works equally for snow. The wingtip rotors defeat whiteout just as effectively as brownout. But however advanced the EH-101's rotor might be, it would be nothing without what's under the hood and on its tail. Without a powerful engine and a tail rotor to control its movement, no helicopter can survive. The rule of three pits physics against the forces of nature. And when the parts all work together, a helicopter can do things even Leonardo couldn't predict. Beneath the whirling blades of the EH-101 lies the beating heart of this flying machine. 6,000 horsepower drives 15 tons of aircraft into the sky. The second component of the rule of three, the gas turbine jet engine. And it doesn't have just one, it has three. Each is about the same size as the engine of a family car, but each packs 10 times the punch. But while jet engines on fixed-wing aircraft provide forward thrust in a helicopter, all that power goes into turning the rotor blades. It's like a giant propeller. The spinning rotor drives the helicopter through the air. The engine's job is to keep the rotor spinning at exactly the same speed, no matter how strong the wind or what the aircraft is trying to do. It's like asking a car engine to maintain the exact speed no matter how steep the hill. The engines must not stall. They must not slow down. They have to keep the rotor spinning no matter how aggressively the helicopter is being thrown through the sky. And the 21st century engines that power the new generation supercopters can do just that. They enable the kind of power flying that would not have been possible with older generation engines. Air Force's 28th Squadron is on a training mission. Their task, to stalk and intercept a speeding car. These men are playing the role of escaping terrorists. Positioning high above, the EH-101s drop into a near vertical dive. They swoop in a mere 50 feet off the ground, traveling at nearly 200 miles an hour. Then the aircraft snaps into an incredible aerial switchback. Its engines absorb the shock of this maneuver without missing a beat. The copter hits the ground in a maelstrom of dust. This is shock and awe, helicopter style. Designed to terrify and confuse the targets of the intercept and allow their capture and arrest by the special forces troops who storm from the belly of the beast. A 
a mere 50 feet off the ground, traveling at nearly 200 miles an hour. Then the aircraft snaps into an incredible aerial switchback. Its engines absorb the shock of this maneuver without missing a beat. The copter hits the ground in a maelstrom of dust. This is shock and awe, helicopter style. Designed to terrify and confuse the targets of the intercept and allow their capture and arrest by the special forces troops who storm from the belly of the beast. Within seconds, it's all over. All that's left is an empty car and an empty sky. The secret to this maneuver is the sheer power and computer-managed precision of the EH-101's engines. Deconstruct how they work. Watch this again. First, the initial dive. The copter drops almost straight down. Its rotor blades are spinning at a steady 214 RPM, but they're not actually pushing much air. For the engines, this is the easy part. 50 feet from the ground, the copters level out for their attack run. The rotors are biting hard into the air, forcing air backwards to propel the EH-101 at its top speed of nearly 200 miles an hour. The engines have to take the strain and keep the rotors spinning at exactly the same rate of 214 RPM despite their extra workload. Every movement of the rotor blades is communicated directly to the engines by the helicopter's onboard computers. But the moments approaching that will set these engines apart from all that have gone before. This extraordinary aerial switchback from top speed to a dead stop and back again. The trick for me is to get the aircraft turned around through 180 degrees and to lose what could be up to 180 miles an hour to zero in a very short distance. As you'll appreciate, that's a very aggressive maneuver. The main rotors are fighting the air, first to stop the aircraft, then turn it around, then to bring it down fast. It's an enormous shock to the rotor blades and it's transferred directly to the engines. If the engines stall, as older generation engines might, the 15-ton aircraft would fall from the sky. But the EH-101's engines absorb the shock of the switchback and keep the rotor spinning at a constant rate, pulling it through its violent 180-degree turn. And in the event that one of the EH-101's engines is shot out or fails, its onboard computers will alert the remaining two engines to make up the power difference and allow the aircraft not only to continue flying, but to continue with its mission. Of course, on the battlefield, huge amount of redundancy uh, and reliability, because you can take battle damage, lose an engine, and still carry on with the mission. Most of the weight early helicopters were actually lifting was the weight of their heavy and underpowered piston engines. 
the development of the lighter but immensely more powerful gas turbine jet engine in the 1950s allowed helicopters to lift much greater loads. What had been an aerial gymnast was now also a beast of burden, transporting up to 40 tons through the air. And while the EH-101 is not designed to be a heavyweight lifter, it can still carry a truck or pack 50 evacuees into its cargo area. And most importantly, its three computer-controlled engines allow it to hover rock solid in winds over 50 miles an hour. It's a critical advantage when an entire squad of troops needs to be delivered quickly to a battlefield. In the rule of three that governs all helicopter flight, the main rotor provides lift and propulsion. The engine, constant power. But without one more critical component, even the latest supercopters would spin uncontrollably through the sky. It's the final engineering secret to the helicopter's success, the tail that wags the dog. And when something goes wrong with this part, look out. Heavy weather, high octane jet fuel, and a 15 ton helicopter hovering above the deck of a warship at sea. This British Royal Navy EH-101 is about to refuel without landing on the ship. It's one of the most difficult maneuvers a helicopter can be asked to do, and few are asked to do it. But this is just the sort of high-risk operation supercopters are designed for, saving precious time that would be taken up by landing to refuel. Its key role is force protection to remain airborne 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, searching out the surface threat from ships and the subsurface threat from submarines. During this refueling, the EH-101 maintains a precisely controlled hover. Powerful gas turbine engines drive five of the most advanced rotor blades ever created, keeping it rock steady in the air. But guiding it closer and closer to the ship and the waiting fuel line is the third component in the rule of three that governs all helicopter flight. It's whirling tail rotor. Five thousand tons of ship, 15 tons of helicopter, are now connected by a hose full of volatile aviation fuel. There's no margin of error. But the EH-101 doesn't deviate in the air. thanks to the precision guidance of its tail rotor. The tail rotor is absolutely fundamental to the flight of helicopters. If you like, it's the tail which wags the dog. Fueled up, the EH-101 banks away on a mission that will test one of the primary combat roles it was designed for hunting and destroying enemy submarines. The EH-101 finds and tracks the sub with its sophisticated and highly classified onboard sonar. It closes in on its target and pulls into a dead hover. Then, it lowers the submarine's worst nightmare, a sophisticated dipping sonar array. 
Beneath the surface, this underwater listening device opens up like a high-tech umbrella, trapping the enemy submarine in a sonar net. If this war game were for real, the sub would be cornered and facing a potentially deadly attack. Targeted by one of the EH-101's four Stingray homing torpedoes. It can also carry sophisticated depth charges, as well as sea-skimming anti-ship missiles to take out enemy ships. But to win this game of war, the EH-101 has relied on its tail rotor to steer it through the sky. It's the tail rotor's job to counter and control the powerful rotational force generated by the EH-101's main rotor blades. The main rotor wants to spin the body of the helicopter one way. The tail rotor forces air in the opposite direction. And by controlling the amount of air forced out by the tail rotor, the pilot uses it as a rudder to steer the helicopter through the sky. Of all the hurdles early helicopter designers had to overcome, stopping the aircraft from spinning around its main rotor was perhaps the most difficult. Double rotors spinning in opposite directions was the first solution. Then came the twin rotor system, with the spin of each set of rotor blades canceling out the other. This did provide an answer, and also gave helicopters like the Boeing Chinook greater lift capabilities than most single rotored craft. But it was the development of the tail rotor concept that finally gave the helicopter its unique agility in the air. We can choose which direction we want to go, when we want to go, at the rate we want to go. It's a David and Goliath dance between tail and main rotors. But losing a tail rotor is every helicopter pilot's worst case scenario. One of the things that pilots fear most is losing tail rotor control, or tail rotor authority as it's called. In other words, if that tail rotor doesn't behave, you can't fly in a straight line, the helicopter becomes unstable. And we've seen, sadly, many crashes with that happening. When difficult rescues or evacuations are being attempted on uneven terrain, the tail rotor is especially vulnerable. Of the three components that keep a helicopter in the air, it's the one that usually comes closest to the ground. That's why the EH-101's tail rotor is positioned high on its tail, nearly nine feet off the ground. As every experienced pilot knows, lose tail rotor control, even momentarily, and you can easily lose your aircraft, and probably your life. As the helicopter spins off on a one-way trip to catastrophe. Then the components that kept it airborne shatter it against the ground literally beating itself and its passengers to death. But many helicopter crashes occur when we ask too much of this unique flying machine. The jobs they get assigned are so very dangerous. We're asking them to do things that other aircraft can't do. Whether it's going up to the top of Everest and plucking off a, an injured climber at 21,000 feet, or going into the eye of a hurricane and bringing back people from the perfect storm. Helicopters can save lives, and you can get them to hospital faster than any other means. We put helicopters into extreme situations for the simple reason that nothing else can do the job. 
Helicopters can punch a hole in a hurricane and rescue men and women who would otherwise be condemned. Helicopters can take the fight against a forest fire to the very heart of the inferno, an aerial assault by water where no man or machine dare go. And as an air ambulance, a rapid response agent of mercy, when minutes, even seconds, can mean the difference between life and death. The helicopter is the undisputed champion of the injured and the sick. When a catastrophe like the South Asian tsunami strikes, marooning millions in wastelands scoured of roads and airstrips, it's the helicopter alone that can bring relief and salvation from the sky. This was one of the greatest airlifts in history. Thousands of tons of humanitarian aid brought into some of the most inaccessible places on Earth, saving the lives of thousands of men, women, and children. The latest generation of supercopters, like the EH-101, are pushing the boundaries of vertical flight. But there's still one component that makes all of it possible. The human in the driver's seat. Mastering a helicopter's movement through the air takes both hands, both feet, and supreme confidence. And when it's a supercopter worth tens of millions, there's no room for error. Few things are more difficult than controlling a helicopter in the sky. Go ahead. They say that if you can hop up and down, uh, rub your tummy in a circular fashion and your head uh, in a counterclockwise fashion with your eyes closed, then you can fly a helicopter. It's the helicopter pilot who transforms mere machine into an agent of salvation or an instrument of vengeance. The rule of three, main rotor, gas turbine engine, and tail rotor allows the helicopter to fly. but someone still has to control it. But at the end of the day, it does come down to the pilot. And I think it takes an extraordinary brand of aviator. At any given moment in flight, a helicopter can go up or down, side to side, forward or backward, or virtually any combination of those directions. It takes exceptional coordination and concentration just to keep a helicopter in the air. Massimo Porro commands the Italian Navy's number one flying shark squadron. He demonstrates the extraordinary relationship between the tail rotor and the main rotor blades. Both hands control the main rotor. The left hand stick moves the helicopter up and down. The right hand stick moves it in every other direction. Both feet control the tail rotor, changing the angle of the rotor blades to point the aircraft where the pilot wants. We have the pedals which move the blades of the tail rotor to oppose the torque of the main rotor. This allows us to steer the helicopter in the direction we want. But it has to be done in a very coordinated way. 
because compared to a fixed wing aircraft, the helicopter is inherently unstable. But when we master the helicopter's rule of three, there are few sights more breathtaking. It was like strapping on a, a, a costume in the morning that would allow me to do superhuman things. You, you weren't flying anymore, you were, you were the machine. But today's supercopters are far more than mere helicopters. Behind the cockpit of this Royal Navy EH-101 is a sophisticated command and control center. It can direct a battle on land or sea, or launch advanced aerial weapons to destroy a submarine or an enemy ship. or carry out reconnaissance and electronic surveillance. And today's supercopters are so technologically advanced, they can actually fly themselves. The EH-101's powerful onboard computers drive one of the most sophisticated autopilot systems ever put in an aircraft. The autopilot can even put this 15-ton aircraft into a hover at 40 feet and keep alongside a moving ship at sea without the pilot ever needing to touch the controls. In combat, the autopilot can do much of the actual flying while the pilot focuses on the mission objectives. But ultimately, a human still has to be the mind of the machine. However sophisticated the autopilot, only a human pilot can actually land an EH-101. Which is why they have their own virtual world to train in. one of the most advanced flight simulators on the planet. Inside this 24-foot steel sphere is an exact EH-101 cockpit, complete with high-fidelity graphics. The helicopter's movements in flight are precisely mimicked by computer-controlled hydraulics. The fear element is there, trust me close to the ship, and you're flying that last half mile approach to a flight deck at night in filthy weather, and the ship is pitching and rolling, and you're on minimum tactical lighting. I've certainly been seriously scared in helicopter simulators because they are so real and walked out of the cockpit white and shaking, I suspect, if the truth be known. It cost around $5 million to equip a single pilot with the skills required to fly out of this high-fidelity computer game into the real world. But when the aircraft you're flying is worth $100 million, you can't afford to let it down. So in the simulator's operations room, Instructors create nightmare scenarios for the pilots. Emergencies far too dangerous to be simulated in a real EH-101. We can simulate major systems failures and crash landing. I think probably the most challenging situations are coping with major system failure, but continuing to fight the aircraft and get back to the ship 200 miles away, maybe on two engines with navigation systems that have failed. The training never stops. Even the most experienced pilots have to keep their hours up in the simulator to maintain their mastery of the EH-101. They consider themselves not so much elite 
as lucky. The father of the helicopter, Leonardo da Vinci, would love to fly this helicopter. You could just see him saying, well, I told you so. 500 years ago, I told you we could do this. And here it is, the ultimate helicopter. The age of the helicopter has been brief, but brilliant. In war, and peace, and tragedy, where no aircraft has dared go, the helicopter has gone. And now, the science of vertical flight has reached perhaps its finest expression. Now is the time of the supercopters.